the vessel lecture. The vessel chapter will come in three parts. We will cover part one and two today. So the classes of blood vessels that we have are arteries. We already know that they take blood away from the heart. Veins bring blood back to the heart. We're gonna discuss some of the major components of arterioles and capillaries and then venules are the smaller veins that drain blood back away from the capillaries and bring it to the larger vein so it can return to the heart. So as we see here, arteries are depicted in red. They are blood leaving the heart. The arteries become our smaller arterioles which then go to the capillaries where the tissue, where the tissues are and where we can have nutrient and oxygen exchange. Venules and veins then bring the blood back to the heart. The arteries will subdivide down, and they're the larger ones that we can identify if we were going to look, say, at the cadaver. Arterioles are within the tissues, and they are much smaller, but they are much, much more numerous. And so it is the arterioles that we're going to learn later that has the most profound impact on blood pressure. The general structure of a blood vessel has three layers. There is the tunica externa, also known as tunica adventitia. It is this outer connective tissue layer. It has both elastin and collagen. The elastin allows it to stretch out and distend when there's high pressure, when there's a new bolus of blood ejected from the heart. Collagen helps keep it strong and allows it to be tethered to the tissue nearby. The tunica media is this red layer here. So the tunica media is a muscular layer. It is made of smooth muscle. It is this layer that actually will vasodilate to open up a lower blood pressure or vasoconstrict, which will actually reduce the lumen size and increase blood pressure. The tunica intima is the innermost layer. It's a single layer thick of cells. It's known as tunica intima, but it's most commonly known as the endothelium. The endothelium is really the master controller of the tunica media and what's going on in the vessel. This is where receptors are, and this actually is the control center of what else is going on in the vessel. Here's a diagram that depicts an artery on, the, on one side where we can see it red. We have the tunica intima, the endothelium, the innermost layer. Tunica media is going to be your smooth muscle later, layer. And the tunica externa is going to be your collagen fibers. And there's going to be more elastin to allow for distinction, especially in the larger elastic arteries. Veins have all three of the same layers. They are just in lower proportions and the wall is much, much thinner because the veins have lower pressure. The capillary, as we'll learn later, is only a single cell layer thick. It really just is only the tunica intima or endothelium. Here's an image in the middle showing an artery and a vein. This is obviously taken from a person that's no longer alive and therefore there's no blood in there. So there's no pressure within here. So in a normal person, the arteries are really not quite this small, but there's no pressure to push out and distend it anymore. But in a histological slide, you almost always see arteries with a very, very thick layer of muscle and then with the tunica media and then you see the veins which are much thinner wall. Here we can see the tunica externa, we can see the tunica media, and we can see this innermost layer here on the arterial side, endothelium. Same for the vein, tunica externa, tunica media, and endothelium. This is an image here showing this is an artery, where we have the smooth muscle going around here. Here's another artery, this is a vein, and this is a vein. Arteries have high pressure. That's why their walls have to be so thick. So we have these big, thicker walls, especially compared to the veins. Blood is always going to travel away from the heart. It's almost always oxygenated. The exceptions are if we're dealing with um, fetal circulation or the pulmonary circulation. We're going to have thick walls again compared to veins, and we're going to go into the subgroups of these arteries. 
pulse points are regions on the body where arteries, it's usually near joints, where arteries are near the surface. And therefore, you can easily palpate the pulsations. So often people are only familiar with pulse points in the neck and the wrist, but there are many other places that you can actually determine somebody's pulse from. Elastic arteries are the large arteries that are closest to the heart. These ones can handle the great surges of pressure. So when the heart ejects blood out the aorta, it will cause distension of the wall because so much blood is filling up inside. And so there's a lot of elastic components within it, That's the elasticity here, allowing it to distend out so that between beats, when the heart is resting and refilling with blood, the recoil of the walls back in allows for forward flow to maintain. So this is the recoil of the elastic fibers are propelling blood forward. That's allowing for continuous flow between heartbeats. These are some examples of our large elastic arteries. That model of propelling flow between beats is known as the Winkessel model developed by Otto Frank. It is here where you have the heart ejecting blood out and so the vessel walls, the elastic arteries, will distend outward while the heart is and pushing blood out. Then when the heart is relaxing, then this will recoil back in and blood will continue to move forward. If we have stiffer, large elastic arteries where they're supposed to be elastic but they become more stiff, that term is known as a reduction in arterial compliance. That's more of a clinical term, and just as so you're aware, some of the consequences of that, if somebody has stiffer large arteries, their risk of hemorrhagic stroke increases. You can actually see, you see this more often in elderly patients where their systolic blood pressure will increase while their diastolic blood pressure decreases. So they end up with really high peak pressures, but then because the arteries are so stiff, there's no steady flow between beats, then the blood pressure during diastole drops significantly. The muscular arteries, this sort of next step, next lower step, are much more numerous in the body. These are our medium-sized arteries. There's a large tunica media compared to their diameter. So we can see here the wall is very, very thick compared to how wide the diameter is. And so they are more responsive to constriction, meaning narrowing the lumen, or dilation, opening it up, which means they are, these vessels are the primary determinant of blood pressure. When there is some signal to cause constriction of a vessel, of an artery, because there are so many of these muscular arteries, that when they constrict, even if they constrict just a tiny bit, it is multiplied over all of the muscular arteries and there is a very profound change in overall blood pressure. We can see here is an artery bringing blood in. These arterioles are the smaller branches that are going within the tissue beds well before the capillaries. These small arterioles are just an extension of these muscular arteries. At, it is at this time, right before we get to the capillary beds, that we don't want these pressure surges. So it moves the blood from a pulsatile nature to steady flow. And so I want to show you this diagram. If you recall, when we did the heart and we did the cardiac cycle, we can see this here is the left ventricular pressure and our aortic pressure is located up here. So let me draw this out. So if we have our left ventricular pressure, let me change colors here, it's in green. So if we have aortic pressure coming here, And we have another beat, I'm not doing a very good job at this. So we have three beats here. 
So look at the green and then now we'll look at the next slide. This is what our green line was. So this is an aortic pressure, this is an aortic pressure, this is an aortic pressure. So this is just showing several beats. So close to the, a the aorta, close to the heart, we can see this person's blood pressure is roughly 120, a little bit over 120, but we'll just say for convenience, we'll just call it 120 over 90. So we can see that's closer to the aorta, but we can see as you get farther away from the heart over here to the arteries and arterioles, we can see the pressure dropping and dropping and dropping. We get to the capillaries, the pressure is way kind of around here in 30, and then ultimately to the vena cava and to the right atrium, it's going to be zero. So what I'd like you to notice with regard to the arterioles is that within this region, we can see that flow is pulsatile, meaning it goes up and down. There's still some surges, even though the pressure is a lot lower, it's in a lower range, but it's still surging. But by the time it leaves these arterioles and enters the capillaries, we can see that the flow is now steady flow. So that way the capillaries are not experiencing these surges. These arterioles not only go change blood flow from pulsatile to steady, but there's also a significant pressure drop here. That allows the pressure to get down to roughly 30 millimeters of mercury so that we can prevent damage to the capillaries. We don't want to blow them out because they're only going to be one cell layer thick. Once we get blood to the capillaries, like we said, it's made of just the endothelium. There are two types of capillaries, but we're really going to focus on the continuous ones. To point out, the fenestrated ones are really in specialized regions where more filtration is occurring, like in the brain, the choroid plexus to make cerebral spinal fluid, or in the liver to filter any um, waste coming out of the blood, or in the kidneys. So we'll focus on continuous, because those are the main ones that we see throughout the tissue beds of the body. So it is in the capillaries that the nutrient and oxygen exchange is occurring. So this is how our tissues get its oxygen and energy. So capillary beds are a web-like network of little vessels that are only one cell layer between that and the tissues surrounding it. So they're real tiny, they're right in the tissue bed. There are these little things called pre-capillary sphincters and they're right in front, so it actually can shut down or minimize flow to some regions and open up flow to other regions. So it just helps us divert flow to the areas that are needed and reduce flow to the areas that are less needed. Another term for within the capillary beds are collaterals. It means we may actually over time, and it's exercise is the only stimulus that we're aware of at this time, will actually make additional entryways into capillary beds. This is very important if you're a, in a coronary artery and perhaps one of area it might be getting obstructed with plaque and therefore we have these other side ports to still provide oxygen to a particular tissue bed. An anastomosis is where we have a direct connection from an arterial side of straight across to the venous side. So it bypasses the capillary bed entirely. Generally, arterial venous anastomoses are there as an overflow. If too much flow is going through a capillary bed, it allows as an overflow. Sometimes anastomoses can form at, in a pathological sense. In a normal sense, it's really meant as an overflow in case there's too much, too high a pressure or too much blood on the arterial side that we don't want to cause any blowout or rupturing in the capillary bed so that we utilize an anastomosis to bring this extra pressure or blood across. Within the capillaries, we have, this is the capillary exchange. This is where the oxygen is unloaded and glucose is unloaded. This occurs through diffusion, just a passive exchange. There's a lot of oxygen in the artery side. It will then, by just diffusion, ooze out or diffuse out into the tissues where the levels are lower. 
There's also a process known as filtration, where there's hydrostatic pressure within the blood vessel that's actually helping to push some of this out. We also have occurring between this sort of filtration and reabsorption, there's sort of a, a back and forth exchange. If there is too much fluid that escapes out from the capillary bed, out and goes out into the tissue, and it's not reabsorbed, then too much you get what's known as edema. And so you end up with too much fluid out in the tissue areas. So as long as we have enough protein molecules in our blood, it will help balance with the protein that's out in the tissue bed, and it helps maintain what's known as an osmotic gradient, and it minimizes the amount of fluid that escapes from the capillary bed. So the con these continuous capillaries will allow some water out, some small solutes, um, like that's like glucose or small nutrients or different electrolytes or things that cells may need. Lipid soluble materials just float right out quite easily. It's going to block large things like blood cells or plasma proteins. They're too big to escape across these small cracks or through the thin wall. So they're going to be too big, so those are going to be blocked. We also pick up carbon dioxide and any waste into the blood to carry it away from the capillary bed. Starling's principle is that there are some of the plasma fluid, and we'll learn later that the majority of plasma is water. So some of it's going to leave through hydrostatic pressure, meaning it kind of gets just pushed out. 85% returns, but 15% remains in the tissue. This is okay. We don't bring that 15% back yet. We get it back eventually. It's returned via the lymph. We're going to learn about the lymphatic system in this unit in a, after we deal with the blood. So once we have our capillary exchange where we have the diffusion and filtration, our nutrients escape, and we reabsorb anything, and the fluid comes back, our 85% of our water comes back, we have the 15% of water that's still our plasma that's still left out in the tissues, it actually gets absorbed through these green vessels that are there. Those are our lymph vessels. So it's like a second drainage system. So we have the artery blood coming in from the arterial side, we have the exchange, and then it leaves through the venous side. Any of the extra stuff that's left out in the tissues is going to go out via this green pathway, the lymph. This picture we can see nicely where we have the arterial flow coming into a capillary bed and we have the blue depicting the venous flow bringing it right back to the right atrium. However, any fluid that escaped at the level of the tissues here at the capillary bed and it made it out in the tissues but did not go back into the blood is going to follow this green pathway. It goes through a series of lymph nodes so that our immune system can inspect it and make sure there's not any pathogens or antigens in there. And once our immune system deems it clean, it dumps it right back into one of our veins so it can also return to the right atrium. So we still get that fluid back, it just has an alternative way to return. And we'll discuss this lymphatic system in two chapters from now. So here we see the venous system. These are the vena cava, these large ones coming in here and up here. So veins are going to be low pressure. They're bringing blood away from the capillary and bringing it back up to the right atrium. They're going to have all three layers, the tunica externa, tunica media, and tunica intima. But it's going to be low pressure, and so the wall is going to be a lot thinner than they are on the artery side. Veins and venules. So there's medium sized veins and tiny little venules. They're just the smaller versions. They're bringing in blood away from the capillary beds. Um, it's going to be mostly deoxygenated blood, unless we're dealing with the pulmonary or fetal circulation. In these small, in these veins, we have something known as valves. These valves are prevent backflow because the pressure is so low in these vessels. So the valves allow blood to move through, pushes these valves aside, but if through gravity or whatever reason, if blood tries to go back down, these valves will block it and prevent blood going the other way. How we move blood 
from say from our toes down from our feet all the way up to our heart is we often use what's known as the muscle pump. This would be in the legs, every time we squeeze our muscles, they're actually going to impinge and encroach on these veins. And so in doing so, it squeezes the blood up while it, these valves prevent it from going back down the other way. So in some cases, if some, the flow is not just going on its own, the muscle pump will facilitate flow up back towards the heart again. If these valves in the venous system are incompetent, meaning they don't meet in the middle, you will get varicose veins. Varicose veins are where the valves, if they normally meet in the middle to prevent backflow, if all of a sudden the vein got distended and the valves are way out there, but blood now can go back down. And that would actually cause these veins to be even more distended out and it will make it a lot more difficult for blood to actually go in the correct direction. Hemodynamics, the factors of blood flow. We have to put our engineering hats on for this. So we're just gonna go through these basic components. Blood flow really means, if we're talking about flow of blood, it really means we have the driving pressure. This is pressure pushing blood through a tube, basically, or pushing any fluid, basically, through a tube. So that's the change in pressure. Pushing blood through a tube divided by the resistance. This is what's going to help block any blood. So flow really is the determinant of how hard we're pushing and what's going to be in the way. So the variables will open this up. So this first part here is really just about how much pressure is pushing. So we start from the heart. Say someone has a blood pressure of 120 over 80. So you have 120 millimeters of mercury as your pushing side. On the venous side over at the right atrium, it's gonna be zero. So the pressure gradient from the left side of the heart in the aorta all the way across the body, body to the end of the vena cava in the right atrium goes in this particular case from 120 to zero millimeters of mercury. So that's the driving pressure through our blood vessels. Resistance me means what are the factors that are going to block or oppose flow? So the three main res factors of resistance are how long the vessel is, viscosity, this is how liquidy or sludgy the blood may be, and the diameter of the vessel. So in a human, we really can't do anything about the length, and in most of the cases, obviously under, except there's some pathological conditions, but in most of the cases, we really, our blood is just our blood. We really can't change its viscosity. So in our body, the only things that we really can change to help drive flow is the diameter of our vessels, and that's what I was talking about earlier with the tunica media of muscular arterioles that open up, vasodilate, or vasoconstrict, and how much our heart pushes and creates a pressure gradient. So our heart's got to push against any resistance that our vasoconstriction may give our body. So in this relationship, it's a little confusing here, I realize, relative radius just means whatever, at whatever point the vessel is, say if we reduce the radius, so if we have a vessel here, the radius from, is halfway across. So if we were to move it to 0.5, which is basically to here, so let me, so if we change our vessel where we really just cut the radius in half, you can see that we dropped the flow by almost 90%. This says that by just changing the radius, we have a gargantuan impact on how much flow is gonna go through there. So our arterial blood pressure, the main points I want you to recall from our arterial blood pressure is if you remember the peak systolic pressure, we have the diastolic pressure, so the peak systolic pressure is the peak that the left ventricle generated in order to push blood out. This is what's propelling blood out of the left ventricle. The diastolic blood pressure 
is how much pressure that left ventricle had to reach to open that aortic valve just to start the blood from leaving. So from the point of the valve opening all the way up to the peak pressure, that difference is going to be pulse pressure. That is really the momentum that the heart is giving the blood as it pushes the blood out. Mean arterial pressure just means what is the average pressure over time? So if you recall, we had our blood pressure waves. They'd come down, go up, dichrotic notch, go down. We'll draw a couple beats here. So I drew three beats of aortic pressure, PAO. So our aortic pressure, so one beat would be from here to here. Oops, so that's one beat. We can see that our systolic pressure is up here, and our, di our diastolic pressure is there. The difference between the two, between our systolic and our diastolic, is our pulse pressure. So in this case, if the systolic pressure is 120, and our diastolic pressure is 90, then in this case, the pulse pressure is going to be 30. It's the difference between the 120 and the 90. So over time, for a single beat, we can see that the average, we have a lot more time occurring in the diastole or the lower pressure phases. So the mean arterial pressure takes that into account. In order to average what it is over, what is the average pressure over one, the duration of one beat is known as the mean arterial pressure. And so that equation would be our diastolic blood pressure, which in this example we're going to say is 90. That's our diastolic, so we'll say 90 and our pulse pressure. So we know our systolic is 120, therefore the difference between the two is 30 millimeters of mercury. And so our pulse pressure is going to be 30 divided by 3. So we know that is 10, so then that means the mean arterial pressure for this person is 100 millimeters of mercury. Blood flow through a vessel can be two types. Laminar flow, that is the ideal situation. A perfect straight pipe with smooth inner walls. We have a little drag happening here on the side. That's what gives it this parabolic profile. Or turbulent flow. If you have any sort of obstruction, you get crazy flow patterns on the upper, uh, other side. This is fairly common but not ideal in the human body. That is because on this side where we have weird turbulent flow patterns, we actually have slower velocities going on. And when you have these slower areas, you can either make clots, which of course we don't want to do, or we adhere things to the wall, like plaque, more easily. This is an example where we can see here in this middle picture, the black represents blood. So we can see this is one obstruction. This is some significant plaque as well as on this side. So you can see there's quite a narrowing going on where blood has to barely make it through some of those areas there. So in this area, we can see that type of plaque accumulation has occurred often where this is a bifurcation where we have one vessel that divides into two. At this Y junction, you often get a strange pattern of turbulent flow that increases the deposition of plaque. This is because, in this image here, I want you to see how the endothelial cells here are lined up perfectly. They love laminar flow, they love high flow. In areas where there's turbulence, the endothelial cells actually go into some disarray, and what they do is they increase binding proteins so any of our oxidized LDL molecules can attach more easily and actually facilitate the formation of atherosclerotic plaque. This also can happen. On the turbulent side, we increase these little binding proteins 
So some of the circulating cells actually penetrate and go into the wall of our vessel. This is also part of plaque development. So tissue perfusion, this means blood flow to the tissue. So what are factors that help blood get to the tissue? Well, obviously the heart, cardiac output. How much the heart pushes out deter is determines how much blood is going to get to our tissues. Peripheral resistance, this is what's going to get in our way. This is our vessels, if they're constricted, it's just making it harder for our heart to push blood out to our tissues of our body. And obviously, blood pressure is trying to overcome peripheral resistance. Tissue perfusion regulation means if you're at the tissue, how does the tissue change how much blood it gets? Well, in some cases, there's something known as autoregulation. So if there's trauma, maybe we want to increase or decrease blood to that area. Or if there's an uh, exercising muscle, maybe the oxygen level. Muscles are going to use up more oxygen, so oxygen will decrease in muscles. That's going to give a signal of, hey, this area is going to need a lot more oxygen, so let's increase our delivery. Temperature. Most people have seen people when they get really, really hot and their faces turn red. And that is to help blood come to the surface to try to get rid of some of our body heat. So temperature can also change blood flow to areas. Neural mechanism, one example would be our autonomic nervous system, our sympathetic and parasympathetic. For instance, sympathetic nervous system, if you get really, really scared, you may decrease blood flow to your intestines and divert some of that blood to your muscles in anticipation of a flight or fight response, as well as endocrine mechanisms that may affect the regulation within certain areas of the body. The baroreceptor are located right at the base of the jawline, of, uh, right at the top of our neck at the base of our jaw. It is the wide spot where we have the bifurcation, where we have the common carotid artery that comes up and it divides into the internal and external carotid arteries. It is in this wide area here that's known as the carotid sinus. So this is the Y, wide Y area, if you want to think of it that way. So this pic, this image shows some nerve endings that are located here. These nerve endings have baroreceptors. The prefix baro means pressure. So there's pressure sensors here. This is, and they're on both sides. And so these pressure sensors are here to make sure we have constant blood pressure coming up and blood flow to the brain. So they're little, so they are monitors to make sure that the brain has enough blood pressure to function. Now, if for some reason, because the reflex that we're talking about here, if for some reason you have really high pressure pounding into these baroreceptors, say we have high pressure coming up in here, it's going to cause them to stretch. That's the signal. So what is it going to do about it? It's going to then all of a sudden tell the heart, reduce your heart rate. It's also going to tell systemically down in the, your lower body to dilate the vessels. Maybe keep some of the blood down there. Don't send so much up. And therefore, it's going to reduce some of that high pressure. So recall, I want you to be able to recall that there is a carotid sinus with pressure sensors that when these pressure sensors, if they get too high of pressure, they're going to elicit mechanisms that's going to help lower blood pressure. Or if you stand up, if you stand up abruptly, then you might have low pressure then the effect is going to be increase your heart rate or constrict vessels to help bring more blood upward. The blood pressure hormones that we will be going through at this time and we will go through it again in unit four when we talk about the kidneys. The first three that are listed effectively increase blood volume and therefore blood pressure. It's three dots and therefore increase blood pressure. The only one that decreases blood volume is this one. This is going to decrease blood volume 
and therefore decrease blood pressure. We're going to go through the formation of angiotensin II in the renin-angiotensin system. The renin-angiotensin system is a very powerful system that forms angiotensin II, which is a powerful agent to increase blood pressure. So let's go through a little schematic. In the kidneys, if they detect low pressure, the kidneys job is to filter blood and so if the pressure is too low it can't do its job and so the kidneys will release a hormone known as renin. Once renin goes out into the blood, into the blood on its way back to the heart, renin combines with a protein angiotensinogen that's already circulating in the blood. We have angiotensinogen all around in our blood doing nothing until renin shows up. When renin comes, it forms angiotensin. This is often known as angiotensin 1. Angiotensin, through the blood, gets returned to the right side of the heart, and then the right side of the heart sends it up into the lungs. Once angiotensin arrives in the lungs, and it distributes through the lungs, it will then get converted through angiotensin converting enzyme into angiotensin 2. This angiotensin 2 is the very potent vasoconstrictor. So now we have angiotensin 2 leaving the lungs, returning back to the heart, and now when the heart, the left side of the heart, sends it out, it's going to distribute throughout the entire body. As it goes through the entire body, it's going to target those tunica media of these muscular arterioles. It's going to cause them to vasoconstrict and get the lumen smaller. This form creates a massive increase in blood pressure. So angiotensin II is one of our most powerful hormones that's going to increase blood pressure. It does it by directly acting on these muscular arterioles, little receptors within the endothelium here that's actually going to tell the smooth muscle to constrict. And it's like having many, many hoses throughout your body where all of a sudden someone put their thumb over the end of it and now pressure has dramatically increased. Angiotensin II not only does this whole art arterial constriction thing that I just mentioned, but it's a double whammy because what it also does is it goes to the adrenal gland and it releases aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. It also has an effect of releasing antidiuretic hormone, but we'll focus mostly on aldosterone. When it releases aldosterone, it's going to cause water retention. When we have water retention, we increase blood volume and blood pressure. So angiotensin II not only directly causes vasoconstriction at the blood vessel level, but it tells aldosterone to retain more water, which increases blood volume and also increases blood pressure. So two of the most common and effective drugs for hypertension are ACE inhibitors, so angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. So if we block the formation of angiotensin by this ACE, recall that happens primarily in the lungs, it happens in many other places. So angiotensin via this angiotensin converting enzyme becomes angiotensin II. If we're trying to lower someone's blood pressure, we don't want angiotensin II. ACE inhibitors are going to block this conversion and therefore you're going to reduce the amount of angiotensin II made and therefore you're not going to raise the blood pressure as much. The second group of drugs are known as angiotensin II receptor blockers, also called ARBs. What happens here is at the level of the blood vessel, let's look at a small cross-section of a portion of a blood vessel. There we're going to have a little receptor. This would be 
the angiotensin II receptor. I just wrote it as A2. So angiotensin II would actually bind to this receptor, and that's what's going to cause the vasoconstriction and increase in blood pressure. But these ARBs are going to go in and actually block the receptor. That's why it's known as an angiotensin II receptor blocker. That receptor blocker means angiotensin II can't bind, and therefore it's not effective. Renin released from the kidneys combines with angiotensinogen to become angiotensin, I like to call this one angiotensin 1. In the lungs, angiotensin 1 becomes angiotensin 2 with the help of this ACE enzyme. And angiotensin 2 is the one that's going to cause massive increase in blood pressure.